Hello guys, and finally, I uh, wanted to give you an introduction to the Core Velocity Belt 5.0 program, and here's what we will cover. First off, I'm going to discuss why I created the Core Velocity Belt 5.0 program, how to maximize your time spent training, what to expect, and where to start. And then finally, I'm going to give you an inside look at what uh, you can expect with the Core Velocity Belt 5.0 Insider Club. Now, you're probably wondering, Lance, why did it take so long to create this? Because on several occasions, I thought I was close, but then I jumped into an another rabbit hole and, and honestly spent more time with Alice than I did with my family. But here's a brief description. Over the process, there was 149 whiteboard notes. And what you got to realize with this whiteboard, this whiteboard I have in my office is roughly six feet long and four feet high, and it's paste pasted on the wall similar to, to window tint and what I would do is I would take these random diary area erratic whatever you want to call it thoughts and what I would do is start connecting the dots and over the time I, I filled up completely from front to back 17 journals and then used 37 research articles so this project to say it was a monster is an understatement but it's crazy the more that you learn uh, the less that you the, the more that you learn, the less you realize that, that you know or, or something like that. Again, this is 149 journals or 149 whiteboards, 17 journals, 37 research articles. I'm still a little bit uh, brain dead, so excuse some of this. All right, anyways, why I created the 5.0 program. First off, it number one is to reduce your risk for injury by moving more efficiently. What I found with the core velocity belt, it's not a pitching tool. It's not a hitting tool. It's, it's actually a movement tool. And what you're going to find is that the more efficiently that you're able to move, that's when you're patted on the backs and say, wow, you've, you've got good mechanics. What have you been doing? Second reason is to enhance your chances to feel success by teaching you how to become your own coach. And that, that comes with feel. Until you can feel, until a player can feel uh, what you're saying, he'll never truly understand. Next is to eliminate the overthinking, the frustration and confusion, which only leads to poor performance and a loss of confidence. I know most of you guys have experienced this yourself. And then finally, this is just really a byproduct of everything we discussed so far, but, but that's to increase your velocity by increasing your stability and proprioception of the hips and pelvis, which we'll cover in depth in here in just a moment. Now, something that I found throughout the research that was very, very interesting. Arm injuries have increased over 250% in the past 10 years, and that includes a 27% drop-off in player participation. In other words, there's less players and more injuries. In fact, one in every four Major League Baseball pitcher will be sliced open and experience a 10- to 14-month rehab period uh, because of Tommy John. And the UCL injuries, the Tommy John injuries, have risen to epidemic proportions, increasing 193% over a 10-year period. When I saw that, it just absolutely blew me away. But why are so many players experiencing these problems? First off is that we go right to drills. We think of pitching mechanics. We use verbal cues. Uh, we put players time and time again in a position to fail by asking 14, 15, 16-year-old kids to emulate high-velocity pitchers in hopes that if we look like that guy, that we're going to throw like that guy. How far off could we really be? Think about this. Try signing your name, something you've done 10,000 times right now, and I will give $1,000 for anyone that can repeat their signature the exact same way twice. The reason why I'll offer that reward is because I know that you can. It's physically impossible. So would it do me any good to ask you to sign the guys next to you his signature? No, you can't even repeat your own, yet we're asking you to repeat somebody else's signature. And that's just a very simple movement. That's something we've done um, thousands of times. Yet in pitching, you think about the movements that are required in less than one second. And we're asking these guys to repeat what somebody else is doing in hopes of that happening. It's just, it's ludicrous to me. And it's just something that drives me crazy because what you have to realize is that the muscles, every move you make is controlled by the brain. The muscles are a puppet to the nervous system. So if I'm confused, I won't be able to move very efficiently. And that's what happens a lot. And you're going to hear me say this time and time again, is that I believe 99% of the issues I see are man-made. The body would never naturally organize itself had it not been for confusion in today's form of instruction. So why are more players getting injured? First and foremost, it's just a low movement IQ. 
And what I mean by that, players today just don't move very well. Uh, you can blame that on, on several reasons. It's our lifestyle. It's our culture. It's because of the phones. It's because of lessons. But regardless, they do not move very well. And what you have to realize is that poor proprioception, that's just a sense or awareness of your body. I'll often refer, refer to it as awareness, uh, leads to zero coordination. So um, let me put this in basic terms. Imagine if your hand had fallen asleep and then I asked you to play the piano. Probably not the best sounding piano, just not going to be Liberace. Uh, but that's what happens if players have no real awareness of how their hips are to move, yet we're putting them in pitching drills and expecting uh, players who can't perform even the most basic turns of the hips, we're putting them in drills in hopes for hip shoulder separation. Secondly, poor hip awareness, mobility, and core flexibility. And what we've got to realize is that the hips are the driver of all movements. If I'm blocked there, I always compare this to like a, a fuse. I've got a fuse from the ground to my hips, from my hips to my shoulder, and then I've got another fuse box running from my shoulder to my arm. Now, no matter how much force I'm able to generate from the ground, if I can't transfer that up to the hips, all is lost. And then the next thing you know, you're going to see players compensating by using all arms. Um, so it's just not a very good situation. Second is just a lack of pelvic stability. You'll often see this in the feet, but if I'm not stable in my midsection, then there's no way I'm going to be able to move very fast with the distal sections, meaning the arm. Um, if I'm not very stable in my midsection, there's no way that I'm going to be very stable in my feet. So how could I generate ground force when I'm not stable? I often compare this to say, hey, it's hard to stay dry when throwing cannonballs from a canoe because that's what so many players do time and time again. But the problem is they look for drills to fix their problem when in reality, most players do not have a mechanical issue. They have a movement issue and those cannot be fixed by drills. And then finally, most mechanical flaws I see are man-made. Like I said earlier, the body would never naturally organize itself on this way had it not been for confusion due to verbal instruction and being put in a lose-lose situation. We're going to cover all those. So whenever a thought hit me while I was uh, creating this program, and, and think about pitching mechanics, and, and I want you to step outside your traditional thought zone, so to speak, Whenever we're thinking about pitching mechanics, think, think about the movements involved in that. We're lifting our leg. We're separating our hips from our shoulders. We're rotating over a firm front leg. Pitching mechanics are a series of synchronized motions that are comprised of basic movements. So, for example, I'm going to turn my hips. Now, I'm, after I'm able to turn my hips, I'm going to think about being stable in the ground. Now that I'm stable in the ground and can turn my hips, now I'm going to start to think about moving with hip-shoulder separation. But what if you couldn't stand there or on your knees and just turn your hips without your shoulders? How, if you can't do it that way, why would you expect that you could separate your hips and your shoulders while moving down a mound, throwing to a hitter, hoping to get it in the strike zone while worrying about the guys on base when you can't do that standing still in an empty room? Yet that's what we do. So my definition of pitching mechanics is just there are a series of synchronized motions built of basic movements you can feel. Because like we said earlier, if you don't have the proprioception, there is no coordination. So if I've got no coordination of basic movements, why are we even talking about synchronizing motion, which is pitching mechanics? What you're seeing here is just a basic hinge. Notice how they're hinging at their hips. And this is an area that I see so many uh, players struggle with. And this is where we start with everything is just how to hinge because most guys will tell you that ground force starts at the ground, but show me a way to generate force into the ground without moving through the middle of your body. You simply can't. So one of the things that you're gonna see us do is we're gonna start with the hinge because honestly, I'm betting 75% of you right now could not pass the basic hinge test. So until you can do that, why are we even discussing moving forward? Now the next one, and this is something we've all heard, I hear it all the time, is just, I need more hip shoulder separation. I need more hip shoulder separation. And that couldn't be further from the truth is because what you're seeing at the end of delivery with, with hip shoulder separation, with longer strides, those are just byproducts of efficient movement. It's something you should never have to think about because that's just the body organizing itself in a way to throw the baseball. If I'm having to think about hip shoulder separation, then there's no way I've ever got uh, efficient movement. So before I want to think about hip shoulder separation to be miraculously cl clear or cured by a drill, 
I want to know if you can simply perform hip shoulder separation from two knees, because if you can't, there's no reason even going any further. So that's just kind of the common sense stuff that we're going to approach with the 5.0 program. Now, I mentioned earlier pelvic stability or lumbopelvic stability. It's hard to stay dry when tossing cannonballs from a canoe. Now, poor pelvic stability is, it affects you in many, many ways. And, and here's a study that you can actually just um, copy this, paste it. I'll actually have it in the 5.0 program, but it's a very, very interesting study. And what the study was based on was... Uh, a single leg test. So what you're going to see on the right, the pitcher is just simply lifting his leg while standing on, on, on the other, just a single leg test. And uh, what they were trying to do was just test the stability of that midsection. Now, what you got to realize with the midsection is that it controls every move you make. The initial move, the driver of every movement is going to be the hips, but it's getting instructions from the brain. But every move you make is initiated by the middle of your body. So if there's a stability issue in the mil middle of your body, any form of instability will appear in the form of stability everywhere else in the body. I cannot have uh, a lack of stability in the hips and hope that the rest of my body is going to be stable because it won't. It's going to be a compensation. And that's really what I see with most pitching mechanics is it's kind of like a ripple in a pond. I throw a rock in the pond and I see these ripples coming to the shore where most are addressing the, uh, the ripples at the shore. Nobody's ever really tracing it back to what was thrown in the water. Why are we having this problem? And most often what you're going to see is just a lack of pelvic stability. And that's one of the big focuses in the 5.0 program is just really strengthening the center, allowing you to move more efficiently. We're focused on core flexibility, core mobility, and then core stability. Uh, but inside the study, what they found was that pitchers with better lumbopelvic control pitched significantly more innings and had significantly lower walks plus hits per inning pitch than those with poor lumbopelvic control. The number of days missed by those in the poor lumbopelvic control group was significantly greater than the moderate or good groups, which is consistent with either an increased number of injuries or an increased severity of injuries in the poor control group. So bottom line is improving lumbopelvic strength, endurance, and control have been reported to lower the occurrence of lower extremity injuries or improve lower extremity biomechanics in numerous sporting situations. And these results suggest that a similar result may happen in baseball pitching. And I can tell you right away that this is the number one problem I see with, with most pitchers. Now, here are a couple of other uh, graphs and pics that I'd found during the study. Look at this from 1990 to 2015. I believe this is 2011, the last study. But look at the, the rise of UCLA reconstruction uh, surgeries. And this is just with youth in high school. Now, keep in mind that we've had a drop in participation. Uh, the second thing is, is like kind of like we would discuss with the ripples in the pond, is that the shoulder and the, the elbow, the reason that you're seeing symptoms or injuries there is not because of the shoulder or the elbow. It's because of something else in the chain of events. And what this study found was that uh, the cause of most of those injuries to the arm can be traced to strength and uh, flexibility deficits at the hip that reverber reverberate up the kinetic chain. So what this means is look at the bottom left. As we start with force into the hips, it goes to the legs, then back up to the trunk, the shoulder, the elbow. If at any time one of those links are broken, well, the next link in line is forced to compensate. So I always say that if you had a job on the field and my first job was to water the, the field, and but I couldn't show up, well, now the guy raking is having to water too. So he's pulled double duty pretty soon. He's going to get tired of his job, tired of you not showing up because – his, that wasn't his role to begin with, and that's really what happens with injuries. And probably a better way to say this, imagine if you were trying to water the field, and the first thing that you did was to connect the hose to the, to the water faucet. That's gonna, that little silver connector is going to be stability. That would be stability in the ground. Now, the hose would be the mobility on how you move, but the cords say they're too short. So I have to connect another cord to make sure that I can reach the field. So that second connection would be the hips. I would have to stabilize those. And then finally, the end would be the velocity, the command of where I could pour the water. But what if that connection in the middle wasn't fastened? It starts to leak out. Well, suddenly, because of that leak, there's not going to be much force coming at the end of the hose. So like Dr. Seals 
has said, and you'll see this inside the first section of the program, is that the quickest way to fix a velocity, to gain velocity, is to simply seal the leaks, causing you to lose velocity. And that's the case I see with most pitchers. If they would just simply create more stability in the midsection, suddenly they're going to see their velocity climb because one, their body's working more efficiently, but two, they're going to allow them to transfer that energy production from the ground all the way through the fingertips. And then finally, a very interesting stat is that a 20% loss of en energy by the trunk and hips would require a 34% increase in shoulder internal rotation velocity to create similar force on the throwing hand and the ball. And again, this is traced back to the hips and stability. But what you need to know is that these areas can't be fixed by drills. It's just impossible. Uh, but that's the thing that I see most guys do is that they want to go straight to the drills. They're, they're trying to uh, fix movement flaws with mechanics. And that's why I'm always saying that most of the flaws that you see are man-made. Had people just focused on the movements, kept their mouth shut, and taught these players how to feel certain movements, they'd have more proprioception, which in return would improve coordination. Now suddenly they're moving better. Because they're moving better, now they're able, able to take those basic movements and synchronize those into motion, and they're pat on the back and say, wow, you've got great pitching mechanics. And then sadly they're followed by, what drills have you been doing? They just they don't get it. So here's some thoughts to consider. We've got an entire generation of players who are moving worse more often. Because of that, they're having more injuries. Because they're getting more injuries, they're getting frustrated. They're not seeing success. They're quitting early. Uh, and it simply comes down to pitching. People don't realize that pitching mechanics are a series of synchronized motions comprised of basic movements. And unless you can perform the basic movements, we do not need to move into the drills and the synchronized motions because obviously it's not helping. I love the quote that, that Scott Lando, the question he's always asking, if everything is working, why isn't it working? But that's what we see. Guys are struggling with, with pitching mechanics, so they go to one coach to, to get some new drills. When it doesn't work, they go to another coach for drills. And then finally, after that hasn't worked, they're coming to us and they're asking, well, do you got any drills? Well, if everything in the past has been working, why isn't it working? So it's really time for, for everyone to consider changing how we view pitching mechanics and what it takes to really develop pitchers. And in my opinion, I'm 100% uh, sold on this, that we've got to learn how to move the body more efficiently. Uh, once we move more efficiently, then we're going to have better mechanics. But most of the players I see for the first time in our camps can't even perform the most basic movements, yet they've spent 99% of their time on pitching drills. And that's why I'm a big believer. You have to train movements you can feel, not mechanics you can't, because without the basic proprioception, body awareness, coordination simply doesn't exist. And what the problem is today's coaches, pitchers, and parents, they fail to realize that most pitchers don't have poor mechanics. They have poor movement quality. So if we just learn that, hey, all I got to do is focus on these basic movements and the mechanics will start to fix themselves. But as long as I'm focusing on the mechanics, the movements will never fix themselves. Because at the end of the day, pitching drills only screw mechanics from performed with poor movement quality. And until you can successfully perform the basic movements, why are you even considering combining multiple movements, movements into motion, which are, are pitching mechanics? But that's really what this is going to be about. And this is why I created the 5.0 program. In the next section, I'm going to share with you how it's all laid out.